Hi, my name is Cassidy Curtis, and I'm here to present Monster Mash, a sketch-based single-view approach to casual 3D modeling and animation. This is joint work done by my colleagues Marek Dvorožňák and Daniel Sikora from Czech Technical University in Prague, as well as Brian Curlis from Google Research and the University of Washington, Olga Sorkin Hornung from ETH Zurich, and David Salazen and myself from Google Research. Most forms of artistic expression can be formal or casual. A classical guitarist might jam with friends in a bar, a Shakespearean actor might do live improv, and an oil painter could just jot down a quick gesture drawing in charcoal. What these casual forms have in common is that they're fast, intuitive, and low risk. And they let the artist express a complete thought, starting from nothing. It turns out, this casual mode is crucial to the creative process. The art form we call animation has never really had a casual mode. Even the simplest animation techniques are extremely time-consuming and in 3D especially so, because there are so many intermediate steps, modeling, rigging, keyframing, and splining, between your idea and your finished result. But it doesn't have to be that way. In 1999, Takeo Igarashi pioneered the field of sketch-based modeling with his system Teddy. Teddy's great virtue was its simplicity. Using just a few hand-drawn strokes, you could create a 3D model from scratch in seconds, a task that would normally take much longer using traditional 3D modeling tools. You might think of Teddy as the first tool for casual 3D modeling. Over the past two decades, there have been numerous follow-up works inspired by Teddy, which have extended the sketch-based modeling metaphor in various ways. One of Teddy's recent successors was RigMesh. RigMesh lets the user not only create a 3D model, but rig it by adding one piece at a time. Although their system does make rigging more intuitive, the workflow they use still has a lot of intermediate steps. The user has to plan the structure in advance. They need to view the model from multiple angles and think about how to place bones and connect them with joints and set rotation limits. All in all, it's a pretty formal way of working. In our approach, we'd like to get back to simplicity. We want to do for 3D animation what Teddy did for 3D modeling. We want to let artists create rich, expressive, deformable 3D models from scratch and animate them without ever leaving casual mode. And we'd like to do it without breaking the 2D metaphor. That is, the user shouldn't need to rotate the camera or use side views. Here is an example of our system in action. The user draws a handful of strokes from which the system immediately inflates a 3D model that is ready for animation. She can then grab points on the model's surface and move them into a new position while our system deforms the model on the fly. Finally, she can animate the model by recording her movements in real time. Now let's have a look into how our approach works in detail. The core abstraction of our approach is that we think of a 3D model as a set of overlapping 2D regions, which are stitched together and then inflated to produce a final smooth mesh. The user describes each region by drawing its silhouette, and our system uses a combination of simple heuristics and hints from the user to determine how the regions should connect to each other. Let me show you an example. Suppose the user would like to create a 3D model of an elephant, like this. She typically starts by drawing a main body part as a closed stroke. She then adds open strokes to depict other limbs such as hind legs, tail, and front legs. The fact that those strokes are drawn as open curves provides a hint to the system that they're meant to be smoothly connected with already drawn regions that they overlap. In addition, we record the ordering of strokes which will later help us to infer the absolute depth order of the individual parts. The user can also mark some parts as symmetrical, that is, duplicated in front of as well as behind the overlapping region, such as this ear. Once the strokes are specified, our system automatically closes them and converts them into a set of overlapping planar regions. Since we know their relative order, the system can employ a topological sorting to obtain their absolute depth order, as you can see here. Now the task is to convert this set of planar regions into a connected mesh with a specific topology that can be lifted into 3D to produce a consistent 3D model. To do that, we identify connection curves that delineate locations where the regions need to be topologically connected, such as this green line which connects region A with region B. Let's have a detailed look at this topological surgery, which can be better visualized using this side view illustration. Suppose we have two planar regions, blue and gray, that still lie in a plane, we display them apart in depth for the sake of clarity. Each of these represents the front side of the corresponding body part. 
Since we also need a rear side for each part, we create their back-facing copies and connect them along their boundaries to form a set of connected meshes. Finally, we graft those individual meshes along their connection curves to form one single mesh with correct topology. Note that all vertices of this mesh still lie on the plane. All that matters at this point is the topology of how they're connected to each other. Once this interconnected mesh is created, we can perform inflation using the method of Sikura and colleagues, which solves a Poisson equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions, followed by a square root to give it a semi-elliptical profile. You can see the equations here, but please see the paper for more details. The resulting inflated surface could look like this, or better visualized in 3D. As you can see, the mesh does get some volume, but the resulting model does not exactly look like an elephant. The problem is that the inflation is performed around the z equals zero plane, and so in many places the individual parts intersect each other. We resolve this issue by creating a sparse set of ordering constraints, which we can derive from the absolute depth ordering of the individual parts. The constraints are only needed on a small subset of the mesh vertices. For instance, in this example, the yellow curves denote the boundary of region A that should lie in front of the interior of region B. Similarly, the cyan curve denotes a boundary of region B that should lay behind the interior of region A. We derive similar constraints automatically from the full set of layered regions. Also note that when the body parts are animated, these curves may change dynamically each frame. We impose these constraints on the corresponding mesh vertices and deform the original surface to satisfy them. To do that, we employ the as-rigid-as-possible shape-preserving deformation model of Sorkin and Alexa and extend it with a set of additional constraints. We call this extended objective ARAP-L, which is short for layered ARAP. The resulting ARAP-L objective can be formulated as a quadratic program that can be solved at interactive rates on a standard PC for moderately sized meshes. Once the problem is solved, the mesh is deformed so that individual parts are positioned in appropriate depth and unwanted penetrations disappear, which you can see more clearly on this final 3D render. A straightforward extension of the ARAP-L objective is that the user can not only use it for modeling, but also to specify additional positional constraints to change the location of selected vertices. This lets the user pose the entire mesh in real time using just a few control points. Although we've used the simple example of the elephant for clarity here, it's worth pointing out that there is no limit to the number of layers that can be stitched together in this way. As long as each new layer's open segment lies within one of the preceding layers, the resulting mesh will be seamless. The ARAP-L formulation works even for much more complicated structures. For example, interlocked components like these rings, or the rod of Asclepius in the center, can be achieved by stitching together regions with the correct ordering and topology. It's also possible to produce the ambiguous cloud shape on the right, with all of its cusps in the right places. Unlike other sketch-based methods which inflate the sketch first and then deform the resulting mesh, we combine sketch inflation with elastic deformation in a joint optimization process. A key advantage of this approach is that the ordering constraints are applied throughout the optimization. On the left you see what you get if you inflate the model first and then deform it using ordinary ARAP. The limbs leave impressions on the body, and those artifacts become exposed when the limbs move. With ARAP-L, the model adapts smoothly to each new pose. The ordering constraints also prevent body parts from intersecting each other. How does our technique compare to the current state of the art? You can see that it produces meshes that are smoother overall, especially in the connections between parts. This is because we do the topological stitching at the very beginning of the pipeline, and ARAP-L smooths the resulting mesh. Here's another approach based on neural networks, which relies on the user drawing extra strokes in a very specific way to indicate things like creases and changes in depth. Our technique produces similar results without the need to draw so many extra strokes, and the user can easily make sure that the cat has the right number of legs. The closest comparison is to our previous work from 2018. That method used similar inflation and layering, but was limited to producing bas-relief models that were not necessarily connected. Comparing our method to rig mesh, you can see that our simplified workflow leads to a significant speedup. Using our approach, the model is ready for animation in about a minute, while rig mesh still requires many tedious modeling and rigging steps, and takes over five times as long. So now I'd like to do a little live demo just to show you how easy it is to animate a character with this system. So I'm going to start by drawing the character's head and body. And then I'm going to draw a leg and an arm. 
like so. And I'm going to mark the leg and the arm as symmetrical so that we know that it actually fits on both sides. Let's pop that into 3D and see how it looks. And there you have it. You can see the character inflate, and you can see how soft it is and how flexible. Um, that flexibility comes from the fact that uh, we don't let the A-wrap deformation converge every frame completely. So you get this nice overlap that makes it very easy to intuit how the character is going to move when you animate it. So let's add some control points here so that we can pose the character and put him in a nice pose. One other thing that you might notice is that if I move the arm in front of the body, it might penetrate the body briefly and then pop out. Why is that happening? That's because we're actually running the ARAPL deformation in a multi-threaded way. So there's one thread controlling the movement in the screen space plane, and there's, there's another thread which is operating at a slightly slower cadence, which is controlling the inequality constraints. Um, but don't worry, when you are done with the animation and you're happy with it, you can render it offline and have all of the constraints converge perfectly. So if I want to animate this character, it's really as simple as just taking one of these keys and moving it around. And I can use my non-dominant hand to hit a record button on the keyboard and start and stop that animation. And then I can see how it looks. And that looks like a pretty good start. Now, while that's happening, I can grab other parts of the body and I can record those as well if I want. Um, but before I do anything else, I should probably animate the other foot. And uh, since I've already animated one of the feet, I can just copy and paste that animation onto the other foot. Now, the only problem with that is that they're both moving in perfect sync with each other. So why don't I delay one of them? Well, I could delay it a little bit, um, or I could just delay it by 50%. And then you've got a really nice walk. Great. So we're in a good place. Um, let's animate the body. Um, it's always good to have the body move with the legs. Um, and so here, now I'm starting to really work on coordinating the movement of these different parts. So it's important to get into a good rhythm while you're doing that. Um, and I can start recording. And what's nice is that it's a recording a trail and it's recording over the same frames over and over again. And if I mess up my animation, it's actually no big deal because I can just go back and start recording it again over those same frames. And once I've got something that I'm happy with, that feels pretty good. I just stop recording and there you have it. Now, if you're still not happy with it, you can adjust it. You can adjust the overall position of that animation curve. Um, so you can change the stance or the posture of the character. And if you're not happy with the amount of movement, you can also scale it up. So if you want a really extreme version of that, you can scale it way up or make it really, really subtle, scale it down. Um, but actually, I thought it was pretty good the way it was. So let's leave it like that. Um, what's next? Well, let's animate the arms. Let's get a nice rhythm going there. Record. And stop. There you go. That looks pretty decent. It's got a little bit of a hitch to it, but I think it's OK. Now let's copy that, paste it to the other arm, offset by 50 to 50%. Now we've got the makings of a pretty decent walk. Um, the head's kind of popping around a little bit, so let me actually smooth that out by putting a control point on there. There we go. And what's nice is that you can really have a lot of fun with a, a walk like this by just, just changing what you do with the head. You can give him a really kind of purposeful attitude by having him anticipate what he's doing with the body, having the head move a little bit earlier. Um, you can also change the posture and have him have a really kind of lackadaisical laid back stance. Um, but really, you can do anything you want. And you can see that the ARAPL deformation is basically going to handle anything that you throw at it. Um, you can really torture the rig, um, and uh, it'll basically handle it. Um, so that just means you're in this very low risk you know, situation. There's, uh, there's a, a lot that you can do. You can have a lot of fun. Um, so let's just uh, give this head a nice bobble. Delay that a little bit. That looks good. And that's pretty much it. I've animated a walk in a few minutes. If you don't want to draw freehand, you can also trace over reference art. And you can project that image as a texture or stylize the look using StyleBlit. The ARAPL deformation actually allows you to move control points in 3D 
but the single view abstraction does limit how far you can push that. To get beyond those limits, we might try basing the layering constraints on other things like normal direction, or let the user change the order of layers on the fly. We've shared our prototype with a number of animators and other artists, and here are a few of the characters they've created. Most of these were done in a matter of minutes. One more thing. We're happy to announce that there's an online prototype of Monster Mash, which you can try out at the link below. Thank you for your time.